the session started. And Gabe, I don't know, whenever you want to toggle over to um, your screen, you can, but I'll just give a brief introduction. So everybody, thank you for signing up for today's webinar on empowering adaptive teams and organizations with Kanban featuring Gabe Abella. Uh, great to have you on, Gabe. I'll make this introduction short. Uh, Gabe is a vice president and organizational coach in global technology at J.P. Morgan Chase. He's also an accredited, an accredited Lean Kanban University trainer. So he runs trainings on uh, Kanban and other agile methods. And somebody I came across a little more than a year ago, really respect the work he does. I've had him as a podcast guest, again, organizing workshops with Gabe. So I think for those of us, whether you're coming from an agile background or not, uh, like me, I don't come from that background, but I think having diverse perspectives and ways of thinking about teams and tools and you know, ways of helping teams unlock the magic that we know can happen when uh, great teamwork uh, happens. Uh, that's what we're all about here. So and that's what the, the focus of today's session is. So Gabe, I'm going to turn it over to you. And uh, again, I'm going to invite uh, anybody on the, the session today. If you have questions, you want to make comments, go ahead, drop them in the chat window. I'll be moderating the chat and you know, pausing from time to time to get some interaction going uh, and uh, just tee up some questions for Gabe. So with that, Gabe, let's take it away. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Krister, for inviting me to uh, be a guest today on the webinar and, and especially everyone for joining. So I'm really excited to be sharing uh, um, some of my experiences with um, something that I've been doing for a while at uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, which is introducing uh, organizational agility. And um, uh, one of the things that sort of uh, we, we, we found was this, this method uh, called Kanban, which is uh, quite useful, in fact, um, being more and more uh, recognized as a key component of enabling uh, or organizations to uh, be adaptive and agile. So I'm happy to share that with uh, everyone here today. And um, let's get started. So I'm gonna, uh, uh, Chris, you mentioned before, you know, we, we connected a little more than a year ago, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go back to why we connected, and it's, it's due to this, this man or the work of uh, this man. This is J. Richard Hackman. Um, scholar of, of, of uh, studying teams for a long time and uh, I reached out to you because I was preparing for a talk and I wanted I, I know that you were uh, in touch with Ruth uh, Wagman and uh, Ruth is uh, was a late uh, Dr. Hackman's uh, colleague and, and you're, you're kind enough to connect me so I really appreciate that and uh, building a relationship with Ruth uh, means a lot to me as well um, but when I was in New York City uh, earlier this year I asked Ruth to share with me her favorite quote um, from uh, Richard Hackman, and this is what she gave me. She said, when we're productive and we've done something great together, we feel satisfied, not the other way around. And I've seen this enough times in teams where you see teams do amazing work, even if in the, initially they weren't necessarily feeling like they were capable or getting along. When teams go through something and they're actually highly productive, it changes the way that they work together and really change the behavior of the team moving forward. And what really struck me is this word productive because um, in many ways, teams can be their own judge of productivity. In fact, they should be. They should know what skillful work looks like. And this is what uh, really led me to studying more of the system of work, which we'll get into, and in ways that teams can learn how to organize their work, uh, manage their demand against uh, their own capabilities. Um, and then really be, um, you know, really do, do great things together. So this is, um, you know, this, this, this quote means a lot to me, the fact that Ruth shared it with me, and it really, it really kind of ties back to why I focused my last several years on <clears throat> really understanding how systems of work operate and how teams can be truly effective in them. So I'm going to share a little bit about myself. First is, uh, as uh, Chris mentioned, I am an organizational coach at J.P. Morgan Chase. I want to get this out of the way. Uh, and that is that all opinions that I'm expressed on this podcast are indeed my own and not those of JP Morgan Chase. Um, but aside from, uh, you know, being an organization uh, coach at JP Morgan Chase, I have some other um, things that I'm very passionate about. And it's really changing the world of work. Um, and these two people, these are my girls um, who are really my inspiration. And there's a countdown timer there, um, 14 years, one month, three days. That, that's a guess. Um, but that really that, that countdown timer really represents uh, the number, uh, how much time is left for them to enter the world of work. And if you've heard any of the statistics around uh, how low engagement actually is right now, people say uh, only one in five people are engaged in the workplace. That's a really dismal number. Um, and it's not one that I want my girls to be uh, entering into. So I've got 
myself on the clock and with all the other uh, great uh, professionals here on this podcast, I think we can, we can kind of uh, come together and make, make the world of work a great, a great place because we spend a lot of time at work. So we should be having fun um, and feeling rewarded for that contribution. I'm going to introduce my team of team coaches. So um, as a team coach, I uh, strongly uh, recommend that you work as a team. And uh, the, the people on the, on the screen here, Adam Shu, Jason Newberg, uh, known them for years, worked closely with them for years. And I don't think, um, you know, again, if you're doing this hard work of, of, of coaching organizational change, you need some help. You really, you're going to need some emotional help and you're going to need some feedback to learn and you're going to have to, to, uh, to disperse your, your energies to gather as much inf uh, energy uh, and information as possible to do great work. And so, you know, in, in a nutshell, what are we trying to do? We're trying to enable organizational agility at enterprise scale. Um, so even organization agility alone is a big enough uh, challenge and then we're trying to do it at scale. And I will say if you've ever... Um, try to do it or talk to people who do it or talk to people who want to help you to do it. Um, we're just going to warn you, maybe you already know this. There is no blueprint. There is no little easy checklist or, you know, people will tell you there is and say we can do it in six months in a year. Um, and the, and the reality is, is that um, it's a completely uh, extraordinarily complex problem. And um, it's a complex system and the design is emergent and the behaviors of, of the system are emergent. So anytime someone presumes to say that we know how this system will, will, will start to behave in, in six months after this many actions and trainings and town halls, um, I don't believe it. Um, it's, it's really, uh, you know, uh, be accepting the fact that uh, you don't know what's going to, be, to come up, but uh, uh, be willing to adapt yourself as things arise uh, and then you'll be successful. And we have made a lot of progress uh, in the years that we've worked together and certainly there's a lot more work to be done as well. Um, but we know we're doing great work. Um, as far as thinking tools, and this is really what uh, I think, Bryna, you mentioned before, which is what can you really bring to your practice? And these are some of the ones that are really important to us right now. Uh, as Chris mentioned, I'm a, a, a accredited trainer for Lean Kanban University, and it will be the focus of our talk today. Um, and um, the team diagnostic survey, which is the work of J. Richard Hackman and Ruth Wagman, plays a big part of our practice, which is understanding what it really means to set up teams correctly and support them on, on an ongoing basis. Um, and, he, and if anyone who's ever uh, read about Agile or heard about Agile, you've, you've certainly heard of Scrum. Uh, it's the most popular Agile method. Um, and in order to, um, and by the way, Scrum is really built for one team. And in order to actually uh, uh, to apply that at a large organization, we need to scale it. And so uh, less is uh, called large scale scrum. Um, it's a scaling method for scrum. There's other scaling methods, um, but essentially you're gonna have to do something in addition to your scrum to make sure you can, uh, you can scale it across a larger, uh, really more than one team. And so those are the things that are really top of mind for us. These are the things that we're bringing to our teams, our leaders and organizations uh, to, to be successful. And in addition to those tools, there's really one really important thing that's a big part of our practice, and that's experiential learning. Uh, at least in organizational change where you're trying to have people, you know, accept not just, not just do things in a new way, but actually accept that it's something that they want to do. Uh, we've, we've really learned um, and been proven over time and time again that, you know, human beings learn through experience. And you have to take people through the feeling of, maybe how something is to how something could be for them to truly connect emotionally and intuitively to what you're trying to, um, you know, help emerge in the organization. So what you see on the, on the screen here is um, a simulation uh, developed by um, uh, Patrick Steyer uh, and Arlette Berkerman um, and their company is Okaloa and they've created a set of simulations called Flow Lab. And uh, this is a huge part of our practice, which is how do we get people to feel what the change might be like? without actually putting their identity or their career or anything else at risk. But how can you have them have some skin in the game to participate in something outside of their normal work life uh, to give this change a chance to, say, to sit in? And so um, th this, this set of simulations is, is really amazing and we, ha we strongly recommend it. Um, it really, uh, it, we, we, we run this for senior executive teams, uh, work teams, uh, non-technology teams, 
it's really a truly effective way. And um, really at this point, we've based all, almost all of our practice when it comes to education around experiential learning. So we'll design entire experiences, whether it's two hours, a half day, a full day, around some experiential activity. Um, and then um, you see that hashtag no slides. So a personal goal of mine is to try and avoid slides as much as I can, and that's why I'm using Prezi today. Uh, they're unavoidable sometimes. You have to do, convey some sort of information. But when it comes to learning, uh, you need to engage uh, people's hearts before you can get to their minds. So I'm going to do a quick experiment um, with everyone here. And um, I want to consider, uh, we'll talk through this together, consider that uh, you had a choice. Uh, you, you, were, um, you yourself were looking to join a new team. And you knew that the team was set up with everything that uh, you, you would desire of a dream team, right? So the work is challenging and creative. Uh, the work is compelling. Um, and with purpose. You have highly skilled team members who've met you, they want you to be on their team, and you've absolutely got supportive leadership. Um, and so they're exactly the same. Essentially, there's nothing different. And in fact, you're, you're actually interviewing with two different teams with these same characteristics, right? So what do you do? And so um, first thing I would do is look at their work area. And this is Team Alpha's work area. And uh, you can see it's in a downtown, it might be a bustling place. A uh, nice view, uh, nice clean, uh, you know, interior. Uh, you might even have somewhere to go right after work or even during lunch to have a, have a drink, not have to go too far. And uh, then you have another choice, which is uh, Team Bertie. And by the way, I'd like to thank uh, Bertie Consulting and Martin Aziz and um, uh, his, uh, uh, James Steele um, and the rest of the team for allowing me to use this picture. Um, and this is really um, uh, their Team Bertie's uh, work area. Uh, it is in the middle of the building. There's no windows. Um, not a lot of personal space here. And this, these are your choices. And let's say, uh, you know, you could potentially split yourself up and, and do two. Let's, have an ex let's do an experiment now and say we could potentially, uh, you know, clone ourselves and be a member of both these teams. What would happen? So let's say we join the team. And then after our first few weeks, we get together and review what's going on. And you as a new team member say something like, gee, there's a lot to learn on this team. I know the work is really challenging. Um, there's a lot to learn. And I could imagine, based on my experience and without being too uh, judgmental, that one team might say, don't be afraid to ask for help. That's what we're here for. We're here to help you. Uh, and the other team might say, we should be offering to help. And how does that help come about? Maybe we'll, we'll learn about that later on in the talk, but I'd imagine these are the things that they might see. Then we do a little bit more work. Um, and... Uh, before we do more work, I want to just point out something that really speaks to these two challenges, which is one, the first rule of knowledge work is the work is invisible. So even though there's a lot to learn, I'm trying to do it. A lot of people don't know what's going on in my head. Uh, that's just the knowledge. That's just the nature of knowledge work. And um, it's something we have to accept and acknowledge. And that's going to really guide the way we can potentially work truly creatively as opposed to cooperatively or just in parallel. So let's go back to, uh, let's uh, move forward to the next retrospective. So we're still with the team. And I say, I don't know what the process is. And one team might say, it just takes time to figure out. You'll get the hang of it. Hang in there. We'll figure it out. And the other team will say, let's look at the board. And you'll see in, in Team Bertig's uh, work area, there actually is some stuff on the wall, which might be helpful. Uh, it might be useful for the way the team might work together. It might be useful for a new member such as myself to really get integrated very quickly and be productive. So let's get to the second rule of knowledge work, which is the actual system of work is also invisible. So not only the work that you're trying to do in your head, but the, the things that you're trying to navigate across the organization are also invisible. And that also is going to impede our ability to be productive. But let's say we stick it out for the third retrospective. And um, you're feeling now, wait a second. I, I, I really wanted to be on these teams, but there's way too much work. Uh, we're overwhelmed. What, what, what should we do? How, how, can we, how can we overcome this? And one team says, well, that's just how it is. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do whatever it takes. We're a great team. We'll, 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 we'll get through this. And the other team might say, let's do something about it. Now, I prefer to be on the team that's going to want to do something about it, but I know enough teams out there that say that's just how it is. And I don't think that's really a useful or healthy way for teams to um, operate in the modern world, especially doing knowledge work, which is we'll just accept whatever work we have. And essentially, uh, teams have then succumbed to become really just order takers. That's not a healthy way to work. That's not how I want to spend my time. And I think uh, we can teach teams to take 
uh, to do something about it. And so the let's do something about it really comes from, um, so sorry, uh, really the third uh, rule of Maldrick is your demand is invisible too. So the work that's coming in is also piling up and if you can't actually see it, um, you're not gonna be able to do much about it. You're just gonna have to do it. Uh, but the let's do something about it quote really comes from this book, uh, this is from David J. Anderson. Um, it's a title for what we, many of us uh, uh, agile, agile practitioners call the blue book. Uh, it's sort of the first real good reference for what it means to uh, practice Kanban, which we'll talk about uh, shortly. Um, but it it's prom promotes this idea that everyone can be accountable for how the system, uh, how the team performs in an organization. So that's what the let's, let's do something about it um, stands for. And so um, there have been a lot of people that have really um, developed uh, the Kanban, uh, Kanban, uh, Kanban's popularity in the workplace as well as a method itself. And David J. David J. Anderson is one of many. Um, and certainly there's been, been other folks, but I would, for the most part, you know, he's the most recognizable um, and still uh, acting as a thought leader in this area. And we'll get to some of the other things that he's done mo most recently in that space. So um, now let's talk about what Kanban is. Uh, that's why we, we're all, uh, we're all uh, on, the call, on the webinar today. And so the, Kanban really represents uh, several things. Uh, first of all, it's a method. Second of all, it's actual a physical thing. And then the other thing, it's actual a thing you also can't touch as well, but you can potentially visualize. So let's talk about the method first. Before we talk about the method, um, I'm wondering if anyone knows what this company does. BASF. And uh, their current logo, uh, or the branding is that, uh, in, at least for 2010s, is that we create chemistry. So if you ask them what they did, they'd say we create chemistry. And I can't see the chat right now, but I imagine if folks are piping in. Um, but then uh, before, they, before they said they created chemistry, they said they were the chemical company. That's not necessarily, I don't know, I don't know how that got through many, um, you know, heads of creative, but that doesn't necessarily sound like something that you want to get behind. I mean, we're the chemical company. Um, but before they were the chemical company, uh, they were something else in the 80s. And this is really, and if you were uh, from the 80s, you remember this. Um, BASF did something very interesting, which is they said what they didn't do. They said, we don't make. So we don't make the airplane. We make it lighter. Right? We don't make the blue jeans. We make it bluer. And we don't make the cooler. We make it cooler. So they're talking about the things that they do and about starting out with the things that they actually don't do. And so that's really um, reminds me of how we encapsulate really what the Kanban method is. Right? So the Kanban method really, for the work that you're doing, it doesn't provide the services. It doesn't, it can't. It's just, it's, these are ideas and principles and practices, but it makes the services you provide better. So these are thinking tools for helping you improve the work that you do. And they catalyze change to improve, um, um, uh, you know, evolutionary improvement or really fitness for purpose for your team and for your organization. So that's really, uh, you know, what Kanban method is. It's not, it's not a methodology, it's not a software development methodology, there's no steps in there. What it does is you take these thinking tools and apply to what you do, and they become better. So now let's talk about Kanban boards, which maybe some of you are, are familiar with, or have heard, or maybe have seen and walked past. So I'm gonna give you some examples here, but you know, uh, my definition of a Kanban board is a visual representation of the invisible system of work. If you're, if you're doing knowledge work, your system of work is invisible. Okay, so let's, use, let's see some examples. Um, I'm, I can't see the chat, but any guesses on what this work is? Okay, this work is actually um, our own team board. This is organizational change. This is how we visualize organizational change, which is highly complex. Um, we use this to share uh, information with our team members and our stakeholders and our partners and even the people whose names are on the board. We let them know where they stand um, in our work. Let's take a look at another one. This is a, a senior leadership team. So this is their work. Um, we taught them how to implement this, uh, this visualization system. And um, it's actually uh, a senior leadership team that was uh, convened uh, by, uh, at the urging of our CEO. And this is a very significant challenge for organization. They came together and said, okay, we're gonna try and uh, you know, organize our work and they called us in and, and, and we helped them do that. This um, is a um, improvement, um, improvement uh, initiative for operational, um, for operations, client operations team. 
It's a global client operations team. Um, so you'll see some other um, things out there. You might see some uh, stars and, and Superman symbols there. Um, those are actually avatars. They stand for people. Um, it helps them manage their work. Uh, we won't zoom in there. We might show some other boards later on. Um, but essentially, this is a way that, that we've helped them organize their work. Okay. This is uh, software development. This is complex, uh, really, really complex work, um, software development. Um, and this is actually a room that was uh, designed by uh, my, uh, my good friend Ephraim Laidley and uh, spent a lot of time um, really designing this room, evolving this room over uh, almost a year and a half or two. But before, there was really nothing here. And this is actually an amazing team room I was here. Uh, this is actually in Columbus, Ohio. I spent some time here. Um, and you can really walk in there and, and really see um, what I call and many, many people refer to as shared consciousness of the people in the room which is everybody knows what's going on. Everyone knows what they can be doing and how they could help other people. And you can only do that with effortful visualization. You can only achieve shared consciousness that way. So let's take a look at another board. So this is, uh, again, uh, really an amazing coach, uh, uh, Patricia Sheehy. She might even be on, on the online here. So this is another uh, uh, um, global, uh, uh, global improvement initiative for a uh, global operations team. Um, and in fact, this room was only, I think this is only three weeks, maybe four weeks. So in four weeks, they convened a, again, another, uh, I would say a senior team. And in four weeks, this is the work that they were able to, um, to generate, at least the, the structure for the work they're able to generate. And the really, um, when we introduce people to this method, um, and they haven't really done something or they really need help getting started. Uh, we hear this many times, they go, we went from zero to 60, which is we found a way to accelerate the way that we're doing work. We didn't really know how to organize our work. And so that's really proof to us that we're really onto something, that this is, this is a way to, an effective way to get um, people to work together collaboratively on really complex and challenging things. So that's the board. Now, um, the last thing we're gonna talk about is a system. And so my definition of a Kanban system is a configuration of Kanban design elements. Um, those elements are those little words you're gonna see on this word cloud here um, that facilitate the flow of work through a pull system. And so I wanna uh, kind of uh, um, talk about really two important things. Flow, um, which you could equate to productivity, which is when teams are productive or when work is flowing, people feel good. Secondly, pull. Pull is a very important concept. Um, in fact, it was even promoted by uh, W. Edwards Deming. Um, um, but pull is a way to ensure quality of a system, which is when you push things into a system, bad things happen. You will essentially um, reduce the quality of things that are going on there. So you want to design a pull system, and especially in knowledge work, where your work is invisible. Well, then your, your, your quality issues and your defects are invisible too. And so we want to create a system that, uh, that creates protection, uh, that really protects quality um, um, and make sure that, uh, that the teams are able to do, uh, to manage their own capacity in a way that makes sense for the, for the nature of their work. So what does a pull system look like? Um, it looks like this. This is a, this is a, um, a visualization of one. Again, uh, credit to Patrick and Arlette from Okaloa. Um, this is, uh, by the way, so the, uh, the board on the left is what you would consider your demand. This is where your work is coming from. And again, unless you visualize it, uh, good luck trying to manage it. Um, it'll just come to you in random emails, in phone calls, um, any way that the work can get to you, it will get to you. Uh, and unless you visualize it, you won't be able to manage it. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, Patrick is actually um, the innovator of this concept in, in our body of knowledge called Upstream Kanban. Again, really acknowledging that your demand is also invisible. And uh, this is really called end-to-end -end customer flow because it's actually um, uh, visualizing the end-to-end -end flow, which is the customer requests it and the customer sees it, which is different from maybe other parts of the system where you're in the middle. You might actually get your request from somebody and then give it to a different person. But really, end-to-end -end customer really allows us to um, understand whether or not we're actually satisfying a customer's need, right? So, and again, getting, uh, understanding that we can measure uh, work through an entire system of work. And so one of the things that we say, or at least I say, is that the only lead time that matters is the one the customer sees. So in the middle, people might certainly be happy and excited that we finished our own step. 
but if it still took six months to nine months to 18 months for the customer to actually see it, um, what you've done is you've locally optimized your system of work. You're not making many people happy. And so we're at, um, lucky enough to have some uh, uh, really uh, dedicated folks um, uh, that I work with create an end-to-end -end customer flow. This is what it looks like. This is actually, I think, 24 contiguous feet of whiteboard. We found an actual uh, wall that would allow us to do this. And you need this space. And they actually, they're, they work right next to this board. This is how they establish their shared consciousness. And um, this allows them to, again, un, uh, work directly with their customers so that one, they can understand their quest, and two, they can see them when they, and, and get their confirmation if they love it. Hopefully they do. I mean, uh, that's the whole point of this, is to really uh, connect yourself to the customer. So that's uh, three ways to look at uh, Kanban. Let's take can, a look can now. I, can yeah, I inter sure, intrude please. real quick? Absolutely, um, yeah. So I love all these examples and you know, I guess what's coming up to me is around co-located teams versus yeah. um, dispersed teams. I'm sorry, I'm, and I know you have uh, some perspectives on that, so. Sure, I'll okay. i riff on that a little bit, yeah. Okay, so um, yes, there's, uh, there, you have choices when you build a team. Uh, we, certainly uh, there are reasons why you might wanna have a team co-located and there's reasons my, why you can't. Um, what we say is, or what I suggest is, look at the nature of the work. If the, if the work is highly complex and you're gonna need uh, what we would say some rich communication channels, which would be at the whiteboard, reading someone's expression when you tell them a bad idea, right? Reading their body language when you're doing something that's really, really complex, you need as much information as possible. It's, it's a, a media, media richest communication theory, which is if given a choice doing highly complex work, enable the richest communication channels as possible. Hmm. When you can't do that, and it's okay, there's reasons why you can't do that. At least understand the impact to your actual ability to collaborate. Don't, don't just blow it off because we've heard a lot of other teams say, well, uh, or even leaders say, okay, well, we can't, we can't um, create, create a co-located team, but it doesn't matter. That's not true. It matters a lot. And um, so I ask teams, I, I'll, ask, I'll sit with, uh, with, with uh, leadership and they'll say, hey, well, you know, what's, what's your recommendation because we can't co-locate all these teams? And I'd say, and my answer is this. If I had a choice and I was spending my money on team members to solve a complex problem, I would make sure that they're sitting together. If it was my money. Now, I don't know if that matters to them, um, but it matters to me if I was gonna invest in a solution um, that requires complex collaborative um, work. Mm, good answer. I also, you know, no other questions are coming. We had a bunch of comments earlier about BASF, including that they made cassette tapes. And that's of what course. I appreciated that. Somebody jogged my memory around that one. Absolutely. But, um, I saw that you've used it with leadership teams. And, you know, I do a lot of coaching of leadership teams. And I'm curious yes. about uh, how you found that senior team, um, just receptivity to, you know, bringing their, visualizing their work in, in a Kanban board. Um. I think they need it more than anybody, my, 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 my honest mm. opinion. Interesting. Um, the way that, um, so uh, uh, talking about shared consciousness, right? So how do, how do you articulate a strategy or how do you understand your team, is, your organization is aligned? How do you understand that the work that your organization is actually doing is aligned with your strategy if you can't see it? Mm. Um, right. We ask all the questions. A simple question, I'd, I'd challenge it. I'd, I'd offer anyone else to ask that of their leadership. Go into, uh, go into an executive office and say, can you tell me what, what your organization is working on today? Mm -hmm. Some of them will struggle. They'll say, I need, a, I need to get my PMO in here. I need to get some mm -hmm. status reports and I'll get back to you. Right. Um, that's going to, that's going to impede your ability to run an adaptive organization if you can't see it and make really good decisions and everyone else can see it as well. Mm -hmm. There's a comment here from Steve. He says, loving this, so far, loving this so far. Any examples you know of where this is used in healthcare, specifically hospitals or other provider systems? Mm -hmm. Steve, uh, thank you for saying you love it. But uh, I'm going to have to get back to you on that. That's not my uh, industry, but I, I'm almost positive I can get. So um, uh, definitely pharmaceuticals. Um, I have some colleagues working in that area. And, and I bet you wouldn't take any time at all uh, to get you connected with other folks working in that area. So I, I'll take that as a to-do. Cool. All right. Okay. Keep going. Let's yeah. Keep going. All right. So let's talk about what makes the Kanban method the Kanban method. Um, and really, uh, it, it's it's a comprised of some principles and some practices. Really, that's that's it. And then you you apply some leadership on top of that to really make these things these things happen. So let's talk about the change management principles. And change management is a really really big and interesting topic. And one of the things that we really uh, embrace 
in um, the Kanban, Kanban world is the human aspect of change, right? Which is you need to respect what's currently going on. And a lot of times when you bring uh, consultants in or change management programs in, the first thing they'll do is say, we need to change things. And the first thing people will feel is, what was I doing wrong? They'll start to feel bad because they feel like they were doing something wrong. And usually the thing that was wrong was really nothing. It's just a, a accumulation of changes over time, decades, mergers, leadership changes, and so forth. We don't even recognize the system work or what, what potentially is, is um, there really is no causal uh, uh, straight, uh, straight line loop uh, line to what the ail what's ailing your organization. And so one of the things that we feel very, very strongly about is if you're going to embark on a change program, you need to acknowledge and respect the work that's been done ahead of you. Absolutely important. That's how you bring people along. Um, and so the other thing that you'll, uh, we get a lot of questions. I was, hey, I, I'm, I'm going um, I'm gonna to do a Kanban now. Um, uh, give me my org design. Okay. That's not actually how you do it. You actually literally start with your existing org design. You start with the people that are there now and we'll start to visualize that. And that, that will help us to um, identify where, where to improve and um, you know, how to make meaningful uh, changes. The second thing I want to do is for the people that are involved, we want to gain agreement to pursue improvement through evolutionary change. And um, when I first started practicing, I sort of interpreted evolutionary change as slow. It's like, oh, well, these, you know, you can do it. You know, they, they don't want to really try hard. Um, you know, they're afraid of change. And that's absolutely not the case here, right? Uh, I've, do, we do, I've done revolutionary change, by the way. It is possible. Um, but it's potentially also not respectful, right? And probably potentially going to cause more harm than good in most cases in our experience. So we want to uh, uh, gain agreement to pursue change through um, um, evolutionarily. Um, you'll, we'll get to the, the later on um, a, a, the, the Kanban maturity model, which addresses, give you some guides on how to introduce or which changes to introduce over time in order to be successful. And lastly, this is uh, super important, is to encourage acts of leadership at all levels. Everyone needs, a, everyone needs to feel like they're a part of the change. It's just absolutely important to this method. Um, if you don't, if people don't feel like they're part of the change, um, they'll, they'll do really um, potentially fake it or even sabotage it, right? You need to respect everyone and, and let them know that they, they're a part of this change moving forward. So let's take a look at the general practice. But before we do, um, I, I thought about how to, to help uh, maybe folks who aren't familiar with, uh, with uh, Lean or Kanban or Agile, understand general practices. So I'm gonna ask the question is, has, it, has anyone actually played the fortune cookie game? And I, I've called it the fortune cookie game, so maybe you don't even know what it means. But essentially what happens is, um, we usually go out to a, a, a nice, uh, any, really even any Asian restaurant or even you know, take out and they'll give you a, a bunch of fortune cookies afterwards and it's sort of like a treat at the end. And then you're sitting around the table, everyone's enjoying, uh, enjoy their meal, and then one at a time, you, you, you open up your fortune cookie, and then you say, okay, well, you read it to, the, you read it to the, everyone on the table. You read out, okay, we believe in you. And then you do something else. You just add in bed. Okay? And then everyone kind of chuckles, and, oh, that's kind of funny. And then the next person goes, right? And then they open up their fortune cookies. This business looks good in bed. And it's sort of a, it's just a silly thing. And everyone knows it's going to happen. It's, 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 it's uh, you know, some fo families make a ritual out of it. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I can't just, uh, you know, even if um, you, you a little bit knew a little bit about Kanban, it'd be hard for us to really um, help you appreciate what general practices are. So we're going to play a little bit of the fortune cookie game with the general practice of, of, of Kanban. And so the general practices are really what they are. It's sort of uh, general guidance on how to implement the method. And, and these are things that are important to us. These are things that you will see. Um, in, in specific ways, um, which we'll talk about later on, these are the general guidance for how you can actually practice this method. So the first one is visualize. And you want to visualize everything, and you want to visualize the system of work. So the system of work is going to be our, 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 our um, fortune cookie game. Not as funny as, as in bed, uh, but it'll be useful for now. So the first thing you want to do is you want to visualize your system of work. Everything. Everything you want to do, your demand, um, you know, everything that, that, that you might touch and, and feel, everything that's imaginary, you need to create some other sort of physical representation of it to help you understand it. Second thing you want to do is limit work in progress. Now, um, 
uh, this body of work is really high, highly influenced by um, uh, Taichi Ono in lean manufacturing. There's theory of constraints, uh, Eli Goldratt. Um, there's queuing theory. There's a lot of other uh, science that goes behind it, but we'll just, just the general statement. The more things you have in progress, the slower you're going to appear to be to your customer. And if speed matters to your customer, you're gonna to wanna to manage the number of things you have in progress. So you wanna limit the work in progress in the system of work. Um, be happy to prove that to you. In fact, the, reason, the way we prove it is we take you through a simulation because this is actually extremely counterintuitive. You can tell people to stop doing more work and they will, they will just revolt. Like, no, no, we have to start more work. We have to start. Then you'll actually show them some equations and you'll, you'll, you'll show them some metrics and they still won't believe you. You have to do something else to connect to them intuitively uh, and, and to their heart to actually believe this. Um, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to manage flow through the system of work. So the flow is you're, going to manage, you're actually going to look at if something is stuck in your system work. If it's stuck on a specific step, if it's stuck on an approval, if it's stuck because you don't have the information you need, you're going to take that thing and do something about it. You're not going to start something new. You're going to focus on the work that you're, you're, you're actually in progress in and try to get it through system work. You might have to have some other help. You might even have to escalate it, but you want to manage flow through your system of work. Okay, we're not just let stuff sit in there forever and get clogged up. That's not going to help us. We also want to make our policies explicit. So within your organization, just you've probably got tons of policies. And even if um, you're, you have a team, uh, we strongly recommend that teams have a very visible team agreement. These are things that we believe in, um, at least in the six, six conditions model, uh, team effectiveness model, we would call those the core norms. Things that other people can see about the way you're going to work together. And maybe more important, the way you're going to interact with the rest of the environment. So again, creating that sense of chair, shared consciousness. So you're gonna make policies explicit. It means you write them out, print them, whatever. Make sure they're visible so that people can see them and understand how you're gonna to work together or you're gonna operate in the environment that you're in. Fifth practice, general practice, we're gonna implement feedback loops um, in, uh, on the system of work. So a feedback loop, you, um, uh, we, in, uh, in our opening activity then, uh, I showed you a retrospective. That's certainly one feedback loop, but if you're only doing that one, um, you're probably not doing enough to actually manage um, the effectiveness of your team, to be quite frank. There's other things you might do. So um, at, uh, especially at, at an executive level, when you're talking about strategy, you might have a strategy review, you might have an operations review, you might have other things that would be useful to improve how you're being perceived or how you're actually operating uh, in your organization. Okay, so not just how you did together, which is great for a retrospective, but how did you actually, how were you perceived by your customer or um, how did you get your work through your enterprise. And really lastly, similar to our change management principles, we want to improve collaboratively and evolve experimentally on the system work. So you want to evolve and do experiments on the system of work. Um, experimentation really means a scientific method, which means, um, I'm sure you may have heard that. I don't know who this said this. It might be Douglas Hubbard or somebody else. Uh, Douglas Hubbard, I think, wrote How to Measure Anything. Um, he said, um, um, what did he say? Oh, in God we trust. All others must bring data. Okay, so we wanna, we wanna have some really meaningful ways to, intelligent ways to manage how we're going to improve our system of work. Okay, so those really are general practices and there's, there's many, many ways to implement these, um, which, will, which uh, hopefully you'll learn about if you get more interested in this, but essentially these are sort of your guiding practices. So now let's talk about um, a really, really important, um, um, another, component about um, Kanban, which is we really believe in service orientation, which means that at the end of the day, you are providing a service to somebody. And there's usually one, a requester or a customer at service, and then two, there's someone else who can say it was any good. Now you might actually even say, well, I, I create products. Great, well your, your, your service is creating products, right? Your service is creating tangible goods. So we need to apply those service delivery principles to the way that we work to help us then, once we acknowledge what we are providing service, then we can actually now improve it. So one of the things we wanna do now is understand and focus on our customers' needs and expectations, which is what, what do they really value? What do they actually know is good or bad, right? Um, so that's our first service delivery principle. Second is, which is truly important, is why um, I get into uh, uh, Richard Hackman's work, which is, Manage the work, let people self-organize around it. So we have another saying in Kanban, which is manage the work, not the worker. 
what you will generally see is great teams you bring together in an organization. And it could be a large organization. And for whatever reason, and maybe it's just a, 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 a symptom of ent ent entropy in the system, which is for whatever reason, the organization resists the, uh, the team's desire to do great work. Maybe through some approval policy, maybe through lack of information, maybe through lack of leadership. Organizations sometimes, more often than we'd like, resist uh, the team's desire to do great work. Okay, so they need to be empowered to uh, interact with that, with that system and improve it. And we will let them do it, not someone else. Um, and then this last um, uh, principle really speaks to really understanding that you are working in a system. So systems thinking, Peter Senge is also very uh, influential in, in our understanding of how we operate uh, in organizations, and especially in Kanban as well. So your organization is ecosystem of interdependent services. So this is a complex system. Uh, the design is emergent, the behaviors are emergent. Once you realize that, uh, you might have a better chance at addressing it. Uh, so we're gonna ask you to reflect regularly on their effectiveness and improve the policies of your organization. So your policies could be your awards and re recognition program. Um, it could be your seating policy. Um, uh, maybe your team isn't allowed to sit together or doesn't have the things that they need to do to be successful. So those are things that um, we want to uh, understand and focus on. So now that we understand the principles and practice, you're gonna ask, how do we get started? So luckily there's a, there's a, there's a really great way to get started. And the, and, uh, the first one is to do personal Kanban. So uh, if you've been a fan of to-do lists, um, but you've done what I've done, which is have like really notebooks and notebooks of to-do lists, and all you do is you copy last, last week's list to this week's page. And you do that every single time. And it sort of like feels like, well, I'm just copying. I'm not really doing anything. So. Personal Kanban was, is something that uh, Jim Benson, who, who uh, was a colleague of David Anderson, as well as uh, Tony Ann uh, DeMaria Barry, uh, wrote this book. It's really an amazing book. It's, it's, it's really incredible. It helps you understand sort of the concepts uh, and, and really uh, actionable ways to apply Kanban to your personal life. And the interesting thing about this is what they say is, well, you know, should I just do all of my own personal stuff or should work stuff go on it? Like, like the assignments or stuff like that. And the reality is they're intermingled. You can't actually easily pull them apart. You might actually have to manage them both there. And uh, personal Kanban um, really helps you potentially make some good decisions or at least present some choices to you, which is what should I do now with my very limited time? What should I do later? And then how later? And then two, or the last one is what should I just not do at all? And this idea of discarding work, and I'll call it demand shaping, is a really, really important concept if you're, going to, if you're going to manage a team and especially a business. You have finite resources available to you. You have to make very good decisions with that finite time and resources. And so this starts your journey into actually evaluating how you make those choices in your own life. What is your life strategy for the work you do now, the work you do later, and the work you say I'm not going to do? So excellent book. I strongly recommend this. This is what you should do now. But now, let's say you have a team or an organization or a complete line of business, maybe even an enterprise, and you want to also get started. And so um, uh, there is um, a workshop, I don't call it an activity, um, it's called Static, Systems Thinking Approach to Implementing Kanban. Um, Mike Burroughs writes about it um, and really popularized it. Uh, Mike Burroughs also wrote a book called Inside Kanban. Um, Sorry, Mike, if I got that wrong. I have a picture of your book later on. Um, but this is a, 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 a sketch note of essentially um, how you might go about doing uh, this workshop. Um, what you'll see here in, the, in, the, in the, the words on the left with these arrows is really the Kanban values, which I really haven't gotten into. Um, doesn't mean they're not important, um, um, but really they, all, they also guide the, how we are going to move, uh, move forward with our work or organize our work. But I'm going to focus on these steps here. So these are sort of sub-steps or the steps of how we would actually organize a systems thinking approach to implementing Kanban. Um, this could be a few hour session, could be a one day session, could be a multi-day session. It depends on the size of your system and also probably the availability of the people that can actually help you understand and make sense of your system. So here's how it looks. So we actually ran one a few weeks ago. Um, and the first thing we'll ask you is sort of what's bugging you? What are your, uh, your sources of dissatisfaction, which is how, what you feel is really bugging you about the way that you work and by the way, what does your customer think about the way you're currently working? Which is really, really important. And these become your motivation uh, for actual improvement or change. 
I think we're going to do essentially understand where our work comes from. Can you make sense of where your work is coming from? Who is asking for it? Um, how often they ask for it? Is there, um, is it important? Is it urgent? Is it, is it a HIPAA request? And if I don't, if I'm not sure anyone on the chat knows what a HIPAA request is, I'll give you a second here to see if anything pops up. Okay. HIPAA request is the highest paid person's opinion. And if you have a lot of hippos in your organization, they're probably, they're probably just looking out to make sure their work gets done at the expense of everybody else. So we want to understand how many hippos we have so we can make sense of that work and then make decisions and maybe even force uh, the hippos to for, uh, fight against each other versus you fighting with them. Okay. Then we're going to model the workflow and something in between here that we didn't, I didn't mention is we're also going to understand the different uh, classes of service, which is you're going to treat other work differently or work differently depending on who it comes from, how often it comes, from, uh, how often it comes in, any of the reasons why you, might come in, uh, why you might treat work differently. And that's called a class of service. And next you're going to do is you're actually going to now invite people to say, show me your system of work. And they're going to get on the board and they're going to be kind of nervous at first. And then all of a sudden they're going to get, they're going to get really excited and then this is going to happen. They're just going to start putting all the stuff. They're going to say, oh, the work comes from here and it goes there. And after it comes from here, then it goes to this person and we never get it back. And this is poor quality. And really what's happening is really live storytelling. We're now actually exchanging some really valuable information about how our system of work behaves and how we're trying to survive in it. Um, and then we're, after that, we're going to introduce some uh, Kanban system design elements and eventually walk away with a board. Um, so that, again, this is the work of, uh, so this case study is Adnan Jaffrey, another great coach. Um, that I work with and this is his uh, this is uh, a system of work for an area that he's supporting right now um, So a lot of steps there a lot of organizations it's probably close to I don't know Maybe a few thousand people that are involved in that system of work. This is not um, Something very simple and, and easy to just roll out, but you need to start making sense of it first So that is a systems thinking approach to implementing Kanban that is one way to, again, another way to get started um, Again, and it's actually the way to get started. We recommend um, if you're going to do it at team or organizational level and you need someone who's probably been, uh, you know, uh, experienced with Kanban or at least been through a, a, a class to help you with this and read the book as well. Um, the last thing to do is want to go potentially if you want to go further, which is okay, we've, we've been doing it for a while or maybe we just, we got the hang of, I got this personal Kanban thing under control. What am I going to do? So this is, this book is really a, 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 the latest sort of innovation uh, for, for Kanban. It's only been out a month and a half now. Um, and, you know, honestly, as an organizational coach or anyone else who works in organization, um, you could see the maturity model and sort of cringe. And I did actually as well. I was like, oh, no, please, not another one. Right. Because essentially they're sort of like, you know, they use them as trophy cases or as, um, you know, checklists, which is if you just do these 10 things and congratulations, you're this level. Rest assured, this book is not that. It's the furthest thing from that. And I'm telling you how to use this book. And it's really based on... Um, the uh, experiences, the real experiences of Kanban practitioners across the globe um, for more than two decades now, which is, um, we, we answer a question. And well, before we get that question, I'm going to show you something, which is this. This is a weight stack. So um, you can imagine um, if you've never been to gym before, this is what actually will help you create resistance to like be strong and work hard at a gym. And you see there's a pin there and the pin can go anywhere from one to looks like 13 or 14, right? And um, the goal of this machine and this weight stack is not to do all of this, is not to actually lift all of them. The goal is to be healthy. And if you see a model as uh, something, uh, you see this as I'm going to try and do this, tire stack, I'm trying to lift this, whether you're lifting with your arms, your legs, you might even just, and you're not actually, I've even done it before, you're just probably gonna get hurt or you're probably just gonna fail. And that's the same way we view the model, which is there's levels which you've identified uh, if, you, if anyone's familiar with a CMMI or capability maturity model, um, there's levels which sort of um, represent behaviors of an organization um, and even outcomes. And so uh, what we say is if you've, never, if you've never really ever done Kanban before, why don't you just stick with uh, the ML0 um, practices and recommendations on how to practice things, right? There's no way you're going to wake up and say, okay, we're, we're an organization of 50,000 people we're gonna be level six next month. You're kidding yourself. And in fact, uh, you're just, you're, you're, you might even be out of business, honestly, doing something crazy like that. You need to uh, really understand that when you're introducing um, evolutionary change, you can overreach. And in fact, um, we, uh, in, in Kanban parlance, we said failure to install. You might have a great idea, a great practice, 
that you think is a really, this is the next thing that we would need to be successful to meet whatever needs of the customer. And it doesn't take. And the reason it doesn't take is because you're overreaching. You might not, your organization might not be ready to take these other specific practices in. And that's just based on lots of experience of, of, of professionals um, um, for many years now. So uh, here's another view of the maturity model and we'll take a, uh, I know that we're uh, um, uh, close on time here. So I'll just take us through really the levels here. And so the funny thing about oblivious is um, it's not supposed to be offensive. It really just sort of a fact, which is you likely don't know that you need to organize your work. You're not really aware yet. You need, there's a way that you should co uh, coordinate your work. Um, the maturity levels one and two really get uh, start encroaching on team uh, teaming and teamwork. And so from these levels here, you see our, 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 our first agenda is relief from overburdening, which is the team wants to do good work, but it can't for whatever reason. Maybe it's, it's taking on too much work. Maybe it doesn't know how to collaborate, right? It needs some other potential guidance, guardrails, some structure to do great work. Next level is managed, which is essentially now we're, now we're actually worried about the customer, right? This one, we're just, we're just worried, uh, worried about surviving. This one, we actually got a handle on things. Now we actually try and make some customers happy, right? We might do that by being faster, by being more predictable, right? Having some actual data, which is again, um, surprisingly rare um, for teams to have actual data to improve upon. Levels four and five, now we're actually talking about running an actual business and being organizationally agile, right? How are you making decisions on how to survive in the marketplace, right? To make good decisions as to whether you should, uh, in lean parlance, should you exploit or should you explore? How are you spending your money and resources to be a good business? And that's levels four and five. Uh, and the last level of six is, uh, is this is really survivability. This is fitness for purpose. It's kind of a, a popular uh, terminology. And actually David Anderson wrote a book, Fit for Purpose, that came out late last year. Um, outstanding book, again, if you're understanding as an individual, as a team, as an organization, as an enterprise, what you really need to think about to be fit for purpose and, and survive um, moving forward. And so those are um, the levels of the capability and maturity model. And uh, I sort of did an interesting exercise because um, uh, Chris introduced me to um, uh, Peter Hawkins. Now, oh, wait a second, you know, he's got, this, uh, he's got this thing, this systemic coaching, and I've read about it and I've heard about it. There might even be some practitioners um, on the call here. And, I, and it's really fascinating to me as well. Um, and the funny thing is that um, in one of his chapters, he says, you know, one of the things people don't understand is, uh, you know, what leadership coaching is or, or systemic coaching is, and here's how he defines it. I'll go through this very quickly. Uh, you can map the actual uh, agendas of the areas of systemic coaching uh, with potentially your goals for improving an organization. So this will be something that I'm happy to, I'll be really looking forward to explore with you, Krister, uh, and maybe other folks on, on, on the call as well, which is, there's a reason that you're, you're coaching, which is you're running a business. So let's link your actions to the business. Um, yes, Chris. Sir. No, I was going to say we should get you and Peter on a, on a podcast Absolutely. or on a webinar to, to bandy that back and forth. That would be fun. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to cruise through here now. This yeah. is another view of the maturity model and, um, the, um, you, you're absolutely not going to see any of this stuff. What we we'll recommend is you read the book and you'll learn about really what are the specific things that you could do at each level. So in this case, this practice says you should specifically visualize work for several individuals through a personal Kanban board. That's something that you can specifically do, right? So the way that this model is built out, they'll tell you specific practices and they'll, they'll identify what's called transition practices, which is if you're at comfortably at a certain level, these might be things that you could safely and comfortably try to improve your fitness for purpose, to improve your performance, improve your adaptability. So um, these are again are tied, if you recognize these, manage flow for the, through the system work. These are all our general practices um, with more and more detail about what to actually do. And one of the things that's uh, almost, uh, I think every Lean Kanban practitioner prides themselves on is giving pragmatic and practical advice we want to give you something that you can do right now and make an, make an impact. So um, with that, uh, I'll just go back to um, Richard Hackman again, which is um, he describes uh, this is one of the two core norms that every team should have established, which is members should take an active stance towards the environment, continually scanning the environment and adjusting their performance strategies accordingly. I can't think of anything more appropriate than what we just talked about which is it's teaching you how to interact with your environment, how to actually make sense of it by making it visible. 
So um, I, I see strong congruence with everything that uh, Richard and, 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 and Ruth have been and promoting with uh, the, six, uh, the, the six conditions and team effectiveness model. Um, it's a big part of our practice. Uh, lastly, some things to, um, to show. Kanban from the inside, from Mike Burroughs. Um, great book. Some other things. Uh, Practical Kanban is also a great uh, place to start as well. Um, but there are places for you to pick up and read on your own. And then lastly, if you want to start your own learning journey, um, create a little Kanban board for you so you can kind of move your learning from left to right here. Um, so there are some uh, things you could, you could uh, learn in, in, in a classroom setting and guaranteed there's going to be, they are going to be experiential. You're going to be able to have a feeling of what it means to work in flow or have resistance and then have something pragmatic and practical to bring back to you the next day, your next business day. We will say, what are you going to do next Monday? And there's going to be tons of stuff you can do. So with that, uh, Christopher, sorry, I probably just nailed it at two, um, but that's sort <laughs> of, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's sort of uh, hopefully uh, you guys uh, on the call, thank you again for, 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 for sitting through this and, and, and attending awesome. and hope you got something out of it. Great stuff. And Gabe, you got to hold up your clock. You've got your, uh, your time yeah. clock. You visualize, Thanks, you said one of the principles today was the visualizing uh, your work, but also yeah. there you go, visualizing time your time. time. So you nailed it on the timing. Well, really good stuff, Gabe. Um, I love how you kind of, you know, scaffolded from just starting as a beginner with maybe a personal Kanban board and then moving up to this whole organizational agility level of maturity, which is pretty cool. So a lot of great stuff, I think, for different levels of learners on the call today and, uh, you know, maybe where people can get started. Just so folks know, we are, um, I'm going to be hosting a three-day class with Gabe in New York City in November, November 7 to 9, and I'll drop a link to that on our webpage if you guys want to check that out. Um, Gabe, you want to talk a little bit about the training? I know you're going to do a day on Scrum and a day on Kanban, and you get a certificate Excellent. in Team Kanban and, and then bringing it all together. You want to just provide a little high level? Of course, I, I think, I mean, what, what we're sensing is as people who are living it, and we're sensing that there's a lot of interest and energy and understanding what agility means. And what we want to do is equip, uh, equip team coaches to really, you know, if, if your organization says we want to be agile, uh, we want you to speak intellig intelligibly on it uh, and even call out uh, what might not be intelligible, uh, you know, what might, not, might not be good advice from what you're hearing and give you some of the resources on how to actually, um, you know, introduce agility in, in a really thoughtful uh, and effective way. Um, because there are a lot of people asking for it. I mean, um, you know, HBR probably has more agile uh, 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 articles than I've ever seen in the last really month now. So everyone's really piling on. And so we want to make sure that the team coaches um, uh, really have all, all of the, the, the tools and, you know, uh, knowledge base to really, uh, you know, guide their organizations effectively to, to, to really achieve this. Nice. So we had a question earlier um around, uh, well, uh, we have one comment here. Are all these models and frameworks on the Lean Kanban University website or where can we find them? Yeah. That's a question. And then we Good had question. a Yes. So uh, in, in the book, sorry, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not plugging the book, by the way, but I'm just sort of <laughs> saying, uh, I, I was sort of kind of angry about the, this book because it actually has every single really good Kanban pattern that I had to scour, scour the internet for. It's actually right here. Um, so uh, some other patterns that are useful for, uh, um, uh, senior executive teams are what we call emergent workflow Kanban. Um, so it's actually a big column in the middle. It goes 1% to 99%. Mm. And um, there's an exercise we, we do. Uh, if you're just starting and you get a group of executives and say, okay, what, what, what's your organization doing? And we uh, give them a sticky and then they kind of put it, whether it's 1% or 99%. I call that a pin the tail on the Kanban board, which is you're promoting a conversation, which is how, why, why is this 30%? Why do you think that is? And now you're starting to sort of uh, emerge this, this shared consciousness, which is you're talking about what's going on invisibly, but making a conversation out of it. Mm. Cool. Somebody had asked earlier about um, online tools and there's some chatting about Trello as, yeah. a, as, a, as a tool. Any other sort of um, virtual for virtual teams, are there any other online tools you recommend? Of course, yeah. I mean, so Tre Trello got purchased by Atlassian, and Atlassian's uh, tool is 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 Jira. Um, there's a Kanbanize, which is also good. I mean, we're we're actually big fans of of Swift Kanban mm. um, because it has um, some of the more enterprise tools, um, decision making frameworks, demand shaping, uh, risk assessment frameworks, probabilistic forecasting, uh, some really kind of if you're, if you're going to go an enterprise and you're going to uh, you know, run a business, these are some really, um, really important tools to inform what you can and can't do 
or what you can and can't promise uh, to your customer. Yeah. And just so folks know, um, I am recording this session and I will be converting it into a YouTube video, which you can watch later. And um, it'll first show up on the webinars page on the teamcoachingzone.com website, but I'll also be sending out to anybody who formally registered for the session. So I know there was a comment in the chat window about that. So, so no worries. You'll get the full replay around that. Any other sort of um, ask any questions? I know we're a few minutes over time. So if you need to drop off, you know, I saw a couple people already did. So feel free to do that. But any other questions, if you want to come on mic or drop them in the chat window, feel free. I, I, I know this yeah, is hey, probably, a, oh, hey guys, I, I know this is a much larger conversation, but remember the last two models you contrasted. So first you were going through the what, seven, seven stages of that. And then you were like, oh yeah, stages of team coaching. And particularly that was about uh, Hawkins work. Uh, can you dig into that a bit more? And so I really like not, not just seeing how they contrast, but particularly uh, there was a point when it goes from team coaching to systems coaching. And part of that is still maybe you call them the kind of the tier one problems on one end. But anyway, there's parts of it overlap, but parts of it don't sync up properly. And so um, any, anything to kind of talk about why that dynamic exists and, you know, sure. in, kind of the threshold points when you're going from this point to this point earlier on. So are you talking about this picture? That, that is it. Good job. Okay. Um, so this is my this is my interpretation of it. So there's another way to look at this, right? Um, so there's also a, sort of a, a team view versus team of teams, yeah. versus line of business and enterprise. And so right around th between three and four. And by the way, like the leap to three and four is significantly difficult. Um, you're talking about actually running running business with instrumentation at every level. Um, so uh, you know, I, I, I interpreted systemic coaching as uh, as further involving the, the customer in your decisions and running a business. That's, that's my interpretation of it. Um, I don't think that, honestly, I don't think there's an actual clean break in any of these. I've tried to spend some time kind of pondering it. Uh, so for instance, if you look, I did sort of um, team coaching is sort of like in one and two and then sort of system coaching in uh, sort of impinges upon level two. And that's because there's interpretation, which is, um, you know, uh, I think that the Peter's definition of team coaching was um, uh, just, they're focused only mostly on their, on their own interactions. Yes. And I think as you go to system, then you start focusing externally mm -hmm. and we go to like systemic, you're external with, with the customer in mind and then ecosystemic being essentially the entire environment. So the actual marketplace that you're in, that, that was my read on it. I'm, yeah. I'm happy to discuss it more. Yeah. I think Peter's take is you always coach a team in relationship to its systemic context right and so and that those levels of context can get more and more sophisticated and complex and you know transformative so yeah that's how he, he looks at it yeah how because you know I, so I like your point around how crazy and self-structured it would be it's like, we'll just go from zero to stage six you know in six months and it's like nope no nope, that'll blow up your organization don't do that yeah um but but obviously there is some business impulse not only want to progress along these but probably, you know, have metrics around this. So like, does that happen a lot where it's like the executives are like, what stage are we at now? When are we going to be at the next stage? Or yeah. um, I, it's kind of the measurement question of how do you get people to understand what stage they're at? Or do you always have to approach it qualitatively? We're saying, so here, okay, here. you're, you're addressing this. Go ahead. Yeah, no, sorry. Yeah, I, I love your question. Um, so th th this specific model is, is relatively new, but I would say um, there's different reasons why one would, be, one would be motivated even one level. So for instance, uh, CMMI, is really you you can't actually have a government contract unless you are a certain level right so there's actually a, a real assessment that's been done so that'd be one one motivation so we have to be x level because we can't do business in this country right that's not what this is right now um this is um uh really focusing on again um so there's, there's besides the fact that people want to be let's say someone wanted to be a certain level um, we say this, and, and by the way, uh, not even this level, someone, uh, business or leaders want to be at a certain performance level, right? They want to say, we want to be able to do this. And so one of the things that's sort of interesting when you're, when you're advising on strategy is they say, we want to do this next year. And the first thing we ask is, well, what did you do this year? Because there's not much chance of you doing much different next year if you don't understand what you did this year. And so another thing saying I say is, you are who you are. And a lot of people actually don't want to come to grips with who they are. They want to focus really on uh, who they want to be uh, without understanding that the person they are is right, probably who they're going to be moving forward and not really understanding that. So what we advise, we advise teams and organizations and, and, and executives on strategy, right? They're always focusing, well, this is what we're going to do next time. This is what we're going to do next time. And I'll say, well, what did you just do? Mm -hmm. 
because now you're talking about things you've never done before and now you're overreaching. It's not potentially, and I don't know if I answered your question, but that's sort of the, 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 the way that we're engaged. It, I want to do this, this huge thing and we're like, okay, but how, what, what, where you know, if you think of even simplistic, you know, grow kind of team coaching frameworks, right? Yeah. It's yeah. like, it's clear to have a, a, a nerdy understanding of the reality you're actually in than just mm -hmm. to set some big pie in the sky or, you know, noble mm -hmm. goal, right? Yeah. Yeah. In, 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 in strategy, most people ignore capability. They come up with the plan for next year. They don't actually want to know who they are. And two, they actually haven't determined how they're going to grow their current capability to do what they want to do next year. Uh, it's, it's maybe it's based on optimism bias. That's how our species is can continue to uh, live because we think there's going to be a brighter day. Um, so there are some heuristics, you know, working for or against you. Our human uh, brains operate on biases. Yeah, right. So optimism <laughs> bias is really kind of, yeah, we see this all the time. Oh, um, I, I know there, there are six levels here now. You said you know part of this framework is relatively new, so there's not a, a, a ton of hard data around this and past successes yet. But are there levels that you think are particularly in need of the kind of uh, the, the 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 team coaching, the consulting kind of help with this? Is or is like I get I guess I'm, I'm trying to have the break point of like you try to do zero and one on your own. It's you know two, three, and four where you need the help, and then if you have enough stuff in place after a couple of years, you you try to conquer five and six on your own, or like you know, yeah. where do you need help? Or where do where do you cut the cord? So I will say this, um, you know, four, five, and six, um, we're, not, we're not seeing those right now. At least that's what I, I'm hearing. They're, they're really, really hard to do. That takes a significant degree of, uh, of discipline and leadership. Um, yeah. But that's, that's, that's not something to feel bad about, by the way, because some of these aren't sustainable. But um, the leadership teams that I coach are zero. They, they've, they are a team in name only, and they're trying to be, they're trying to work together. And they've got huge, huge, goals and initiatives that they're trying to overcome, but they don't actually understand they have, they need a process yet. So that's, I, I think, you know, there's team, there's, there's pl plenty of uh, people at every level and especially lower levels, because honestly, uh, we have, the, the, it goes back to your work is invisible. You don't actually believe that you okay. need to actually visualize it. I, I, to, sorry, to, so to recap what you're saying, it's like I was expecting, oh, you must be this tall to ride before this, you know, t team coaching makes sense. And it's like, no, no, start it right from the beginning because or else you won't make any, any progress doing this stuff. Um, I mean, it's, I think it's still start with what you do now. Like we'll, we'll, we'll always say that, right? We'll always say like if I engage a team and they, they, they might not even know it's called Kanban, but they actually have some data to support yep. it then I would start, I would map that to what the, the practices are and say, okay, well, this might be things that you would need to reinforce because these are risks for you. Got it. These are gaps in the way you're currently performing. And by the way, these are probably the next most reasonable interventions or new practices we could introduce without risking um, rejection or fail failure to install. You pass, Gabe. <laughs> oh, <is that>? Sorry. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, lots of great um, stuff here to go deeper on. Uh, love all those recommended readings. Now you've uh, you've blown my summer, Gabe. So uh, I've, summer. you've already been blowing my um, my reading list for a while. But anyways, now I've got a few more to add. But all good stuff. All good fun. Um, really great intro today. And again, I think there's some scaffolding here for people at all levels. So really appreciated your your work on that and uh, great thought leadership in this area, Gabe. So. Strong work. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks so again, much, Krista. Everyone, we're going to make this a recording available as a replay. I'll post it probably later today or this evening on the webinars page of the teamcoachingzone.com website. Great. If you registered, I'll send a link out with that and, uh, you know, maybe the chat log or if there's anything else. So thanks everybody for dropping in today and uh, look forward to seeing you again in future, future sessions. Thanks so much. Take care. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks, Krista and Gabe. Yep. Thank you.